Welcome to a full day of 1960s meals. I haven't done one of these in a while. Um, actually, I was just about to check and see. The last full day of meals that I posted was from the 1980s. That was the one where I took my little field trip. That was super fun. That's my oven preheating because I'm gonna cook here in a second. The last full day of meals video that I posted, September 3rd. So September, September was the last time that I did one of these. I think these videos are a favorite. Usually I like to start cooking the night before, especially if I'm gonna do any baked goods or anything. But here is the cookbook that I'm gonna be using. It's the Pillsbury Family Cookbook. This was originally published in 1963. It did come in a binder edition. I don't have the binder edition. Would love to find the binder edition out, out there in the wild. Yeah, this is gonna be a really fun one to go through. It uses a lot of Pillsbury products, you know, flour, even canned biscuits at this point. We've got some bake-off recipes in here, I think. Uh, so let me show you what my first recipe is going to be. I am going to be making this quick nut bread. And this is gonna be for part of my breakfast tomorrow and also maybe like, I don't know, snack or dessert or something like that. Sift flour with soda and salt. I actually did that in advance. So this is two cups of flour, one teaspoon of baking soda, one teaspoon of salt. I'm doing the full recipe, folks. Cream together butter and sugar. Yes, this is butter. <laughs> Sorry, I was looking, I was looking one recipe above. That was not what I was making. So this is some very soft butter, half a cup. And I have three quarters of a cup of white sugar. So now I'm just gonna cream that together with my electric mixer. Butter and sugar all mixed together. Next, I have to add eggs and vanilla extract. So I have two eggs here. And then there's my teaspoon of vanilla extract. Beat well. Blend dry ingredients until just moist. So I'm gonna use a spatula for that part. This spatula, in fact. <laughs> Give that a little scrape before I get started. So that's my flour, my teaspoon of baking soda, and my teaspoon of salt. Fold that in with a spatula. Let's get that out of here. You know, when I cook in real life, I don't pre-measure everything necessarily <laughs> in these cute little dishes. I do this for filming purposes. And yes, I do create a colossal amount of dishes when I film. <laughs> I've had people ask me and like, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? So it's just easier for me to like pre-measure everything when I'm gonna film. You know, I'm not like scrambling around. It would take me, I think, so much longer on camera. So I try to, I try to do a little pre-measuring as much as possible. And I, you know, I started using these trays. I think that's pretty helpful for me. It's helpful for me. I don't know about you. Stir in buttermilk and nuts. So when I planned this particular menu, I really did try to plan it using things, mostly things that I already had on hand. I think there was maybe like one, maybe between one and three things I had to buy. I can't even remember offhand what, what they were, but you know, I had some buttermilk that I bought for another recipe that I did not end up making. So I'm like, what am I gonna do? You know, I saw that this recipe had a cup of buttermilk in it and I was like, perfect. And I already had walnuts. I actually wanted to use some of these walnuts up. So this is, that was a cup of buttermilk and a cup of walnuts. It just said chopped nuts in the recipe. I often see that in vintage recipes where it's like chopped nuts, who cares what kind? So I went with walnuts, but you know, I'm sure you could go with pecans or whatever you got. I kind of love the smell of buttermilk. <laughs> is that weird, that sour smell? I don't mind it a bit. I don't know, something that tangy smell. So I've already prepared my pan too. It said, to grease the bottom of the pan. I did get a little on the sides, but I am a little intrigued by this recipe. It doesn't seem too sweet. You know, sometimes you want some like a breakfast bread or muffin that's just, you know, sweet, but not too sweet. A lot like the oatmeal muffins I made in my 1950s video. Let's take this out. So now I'm gonna pour this batter into my prepared pan. I'm trying to do it this way, but you know, I'm gonna switch directions here in a second. <laughs> I just do that for the camera. We turn it the other way when I really want to finish it off. I'm letting you in on my secrets. <laughs> Let's just smooth that out a minute here. So it's all in my pan. I have to bake this for 55 to 60 minutes in a 350 degree oven. She is beautiful. I baked this loaf for 55 minutes. It said like 55 to 60 minutes. This has been cooling probably for 30 minutes. So it is still a little warm, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut it open. I think it's ready in okay to eat. Uh, I'm sampling it tonight, but I do plan <laughs> I do plan to have this as part of my breakfast tomorrow. Cutting very nicely. It does smell delicious. 
Not, I definitely smell the walnuts. When I cut into it, it's very walnut heavy on the scent. Ooh, it is hot in there. Yes, I cut a slice out of the middle. <laughs> I'll tell you why I do that. This is what that looks like. If you like walnuts, you're maybe gonna like this. I mean, I don't even know if I like it yet. I started cutting my quick breads and even like homemade bread like this because when you cut the end, sometimes the like exposed end can dry out. But if you cut it out of the middle or like in into the loaf, you can do that. <laughs> and then you don't actually like have any exposed edges. Some, some of you may not think that makes a difference. I feel like it has, you know, I feel like it has, especially because it takes us longer you know, it's just my husband and I, like, it takes us longer to eat stuff like this. I think it's gonna be a little more manageable if I cut it into a smaller piece. Mmm, mm-hmm. That's really nice. It's not like an in-your-face sweet kind of quick bread at all. So if that's what you're looking for, this isn't it. It's very similar to those oatmeal muffins I made from my 1950s video. Lightly sweet. I'm gonna put butter on this for sure. It's got a lot of good flavor from those walnuts. If you like walnuts, if not, you know, sub something else in. I could see this being made into muffins as well, maybe. But this is really good. It has a lovely texture. It has a nice, like, browned kind of edge on the sides and bottom. Just the little bit of a crunch there, which is nice. It's more of a plain flavor than, like, a banana bread or a blueberry muffin or something like that. But I think this is going to be a perfect little thing to go with my breakfast tomorrow. Good morning. <laughs> I just did my like morning walk, my physical therapy and stretches. So now I'm ready for breakfast. I made the nut bread last night. So that's going to be part of it. But then I'm also making, what is it called? Eggs in a bacon ring. So this is very similar to the little baked egg that I made, I think for my 50s studio. I mean, it's kind of similar. It's not exactly the same. Basically it's a cup with like an, a piece of bacon around it. You crack an egg in and then you bake it. So it is a baked egg. And I really liked that first baked egg, so I thought, let's try this one. There's also going to be a mystery beverage, which maybe, you know, maybe you can see back here. Maybe you can recognize it. The full recipe of this makes six of these little cups, but it's just me, so I'm gonna make one, but that made it very easy to figure out the recipe and cut it down. One piece of bacon, one egg. If I'm gonna fry bacon in a skillet, I like to start with a cold skillet, and then we'll get some heat under it. So I'm just gonna let this cook for a few minutes because it doesn't actually need to be crisp. It just needs to kind of like kick off the cooking process. I usually don't even fry my bacon in a pan, to be honest. I, I do a pack at a time in the oven. <laughs> I was so busy adjusting the tripod that I might have let this bacon get a little too crisp. We're gonna, we're gonna press on, we're gonna keep going. It'll be fine, it's not the end of the world. Curl each bacon slice around the inside of a custard cup. So I have these little like ramekin kind of custard cups that I use a lot. Also, I probably should have done two pieces of bacon. Should I do a smaller custard cup? I have a smaller one, let's try, let's, let's do it. Okay, we're gonna go this custard cup. <laughs> I mean, even then, I think the bacon was bigger in the 60s. <laughs> I'm gonna fry another piece of bacon, just strain from the recipe, but it's, I mean, I'm trying to make it fit here, so one moment. <laughs> bacon number two. Uh, I'm gonna switch back to this white, I think. It's a little bit. Yeah. Oh, hey, that kind of like made a nice shape, didn't it? So you're supposed to take your bacon, ideally one piece, but this is gonna be a two piece morning. And you can just like wrap it around the inside kind of. This is like such a good idea in theory, but we'll see if it actually, <laughs> if it actually works. Okay, and then you take an egg, maybe. Oops, hopefully it didn't break the yolk, but there we go. Crack it into the middle here. I'll just add some salt, just a little pinch, and then I'll add some fresh cracked pepper. Okay, so I think this is now ready for the oven. And I'm gonna be using my little toaster oven that I got several months ago. I still love using this. I've been preheating it for maybe like 10 to 12 minutes, and these eggs, this egg singular, is supposed to bake for 10 to 15 minutes. I'm just gonna pop it in there. I did end up sort of relocating it for the holidays because we needed all the counter space we could we could get for Thanksgiving and Christmas, but it's back in place. Having it to use for something like this, where I'm just making like one egg in a cup is perfect because I didn't want to have to preheat my entire oven for that. Um, so we'll see how it turns out. I do like to use it for toast and, you know, reheating certain things like pizza and stuff like that. Hopefully it does the job for this little bacon and egg cup. Today's breakfast beverage is not going to be coffee. It's gonna be this. So maybe you saw this in the background. <laughs> and I actually, I use this for another recipe on 
my Patreon. So I kind of ruined the label and had to put it back. I saved that label just for this. Three tablespoons to 12 ounces of water. I'm gonna do eight ounces of water and two tablespoons. And even then I may thin this out just a little. Do that. It, it seems like kind of a lot. I haven't really like had this in a long time other than the recipe I just made. But before that, I don't think I'd ever bought this as an adult. <laughs> so let's add our water. This is eight ounces of water. Okay. Oh, it feels thick. <laughs> I'm gonna try a sip here before I decide if I wanna add more water. That is sweet. Yeah, I am gonna add some more. I'm gonna add some more water. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like the instructions are a little bit generous on that powder. Am I gonna get some coffee later? Probably. The, the likelihood is high, but I thought this would be a fun thing. <laughs> a fun thing to have for my 60s breakfast because I believe, um, if I'm remembering correctly, it was introduced in 1957. It was very popular back in the day. I know we had this a little bit when I was growing up. I remember it coming in like a glass jar. Still very sweet, but like much better. I think we're in business. <laughs> So I got my breakfast plate. Yes, the nut bread that I <laughs> cut on camera is quite crooked, but it's fine. It's morning. What can you expect from me? I tried this last night, but I'm gonna try it again. Very good. I know I was having a little bit of a hard time describing it last night. If you think like quick breads like banana bread, those are very sweet and cake-like. This is not very sweet, kind of like wholesome. I don't know. Like I said, it has like a little bit more of a plain flavor to it, which not in a bad way. I really liked this with butter. Actually, I might put some on. I think it would be excellent with like cream cheese. Yeah, like I think you could slice this a little bit smaller, put some cream cheese on it and make kind of like a tea sandwich. I think that would be really good. So now I have my little my little bacon cup and the, the toaster oven, I'm pointing that way because it's behind the camera. The toaster oven did a great job. It was, it cooked perfectly. This is just the way I would probably like it and it's the way it would have ended up in the oven. Having a small kind of like toaster oven or something, if you're in a small household or a single person especially, really good for stuff like this. But if you're having a party and you wanna make like a whole bunch of these, easy to do in the oven. I like baked eggs for something like that because it's like you just prep all of them and you put them in the oven and you go about like doing all of the other millions of things you have to do if you're hosting. Okay, let's just give it a try. Mm, it's an egg. <laughs> That's a tasty egg though. Yeah, some of the bacon flavor kind of like seeped into the egg. I'm probably doing this like not in a very polite way. Sorry, it's just me here. I mean, it's gonna be all of you <laughs> watching watching me by the time I edit this video, but mm -hmm. that's really good. Mm. That's delightful. I love eggs in the morning. Typical breakfast for me, sometimes it's like egg and toast or I'll do avocado toast. Yeah, I'm fancy like that. Or I'll do oatmeal, I like oats with um, frozen blueberries. So those are kind of like three of my typical go-to breakfast, but this is a really good one. I mean, I already tried this and I added a few ounces of water to it. Yeah, <laughs> tasty and sweet, but like I had to add quite a few <laughs> more ounces of water to that. I think like if I wanted to follow the instructions kind of, like I would, I would do two scoops, like two tablespoons of the powder to 12 ounces of water. You're supposed to do three tablespoons of 12 ounces of water. That's too much for me. But anyway, I'm gonna enjoy my breakfast and I'll see you at lunch. Ran a few errands, now I'm back home and ready to put together my lunch. So today's lunch menu is going to consist of carrot and raisin salad and hot dog s'mores. No, <laughs> it is not what you think, okay? You'll just have to wait and see what a hot dog s'more is. I'm gonna get started putting together my carrot salad. time for hot dog s'mores. <laughs> and that's what these are. Basically, it's hot dogs with mashed potatoes and cheese kind of, but you'll you'll see as I as I go along. The first thing I have to do is make a topping, and to do that I have some melted butter 
and some potato flakes. I'm attempting to cut this recipe in half. The quantities are a little weird, so I'm doing my best. I'll put the full recipe in the description down below. They basically want you to make just like thicker mashed potatoes. With that being said, I wonder if you could just use leftover mashed potatoes for this if you had them. Now I'm following the instructions for two mashed potato servings, but I'm reducing the amount of water basically. I have to add water, salt, and butter and heat that to a boil. It came out kind of witchy sounding when I said that. <laughs> heat it to a boil. I would say, whoops, that that is a boil. <laughs> so now I have to turn the heat off, add milk, and then add my potato flakes and stir, stir, stir. And look at that, we got, we got some mashed potatoes. We have everything kind of gathered up. We are gathered here today to make hot dog s'mores. <laughs> Split frankfurters in half lengthwise. I don't think, I'm, am I supposed to cut all the way through? I think I got it, like sort of almost all the way through. Yeah, I almost have to cut all the way. So we're gonna go pretty close to all the way. So I'm opening it up, <laughs> putting it here. You stay open, you stay. And I'm only making one of these for myself. You actually, that might be, yeah, we're gonna use this one. This one, I did a little bit better of a job. All right, I prepared my mashed potatoes as directed and decreased the water. Now I have to add, let me just move this. Ugh. We're getting busy here. We're getting crowded <laughs> for such a strange, small <laughs> recipe. There's like a lot of things happening. Okay, so these are my mashed potatoes. They're very thick. Oh man. I need to add a little bit of beaten egg. I'm gonna try to dump about, I don't know, half of this. So we're gonna try to mix that in. Spread potatoes over frankfurters and top with two or three slices of cheese. I'm not even gonna use all of these potatoes. Like I said, this one was a little bit wonky to cut down. So these potatoes will probably get baked and eaten tomorrow. Please hold, oh, I'm making a mess. What else is new? So I need to spread some potatoes on my frankfurter. <laughs> This is cracking me up. I don't know why they decided to call this s'mores. I guess it's kind of like a savory s'more with like potato and cheese in the middle of two frankfurters instead of marshmallow and chocolate in the middle of two, two graham crackers. So I guess the potatoes are technically like the marshmallow part we're working with innovation. I think we got a good amount here and I can see why they wanted these to be thick because you don't want the potatoes to run all over the place. So I'm gonna take slice of American cheese and kind of fold it in half. I don't actually, let's do this a little bit different. I want cheese all the way through, so I'm gonna fold it in half again. I make two, two thin little strips, I guess. Yeah, okay. Looking, I think this is right. I think we're getting there. Cover with remaining frankfurters. So there's my remaining frankfurter and I'm supposed to put it like that. So I'm making a little, a little sandwich of the potatoes. Top with remaining cheese and sprinkle with crumbs, like the potato crumbs I made. Cheese, we got cheese. These little crumbs. I'm, yeah, I probably shouldn't have made as many of these because I'm definitely not gonna use them on this. Yeah, wow. Secure with wooden picks. So I've got just some regular wooden toothpicks here. I guess I'll just do like, like that. Just maybe so it'll stay in place. All right. Bake at 400 degrees for 15 to 20 minutes or until golden brown. There is my plate. Got my little bit of carrot salad here, my hot dog s'more. All of this was stuff I already had on hand. I think I mentioned earlier, I'm really, really trying to use up some of the ingredients that I already have on hand. I definitely bought the potato flakes for another recipe and they were just kind of in my pantry because I don't use them very often. The hot dogs I think were left over from my very first budget video of this year, so 1950s budget recipes. And they were just kind of like hanging out in my freezer. So I'm like, let's use it up. I always have carrots. Uh, always have raisins, peanuts were just kind of in the in the pantry as well. So hopefully I accomplished using a few things that, you know, that I wanted to use up. I'm gonna start with this carrot salad. Now, I believe I made a carrot salad for another full day of meals video. 
and it was really tasty. I happen to enjoy carrots a lot. I know the raisins are not gonna be high on the list for a lot of you. I think that's very nice. It's not drowning in mayo. It's just got like enough to moisten it a little bit. The peanuts are nice and crunchy, but also nice and salty. So that adds something to it. And I kind of like the texture of the raisins. It's a little chewy. I think it's a good combination. The other carrot salad I made, if I'm remembering correctly, that also had like lemon in it. And that was really good. I don't even think this one needs it. Um, I think it's a pretty easy little cold salad that you can keep in the fridge if you want, if you like these things. So you're supposed to use coarsely grated carrots for this. The grater that I used was perfect. I love using that to grate carrots, especially. Uh, I got it at Pampered Chef like years and years ago. And it grates whatever you're doing like kind of coarsely. And then also, I don't know if you can see it, it grates on both sides so I can go back and forth and it'll grate with each side, you know? <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense. If I can find a similar one, I will link it in the description down below. I don't even know if they still make that one, but I really like it. And now, the main event, the hot dog s'more. <laughs> this is like not a super precise recipe. If you have leftover mashed potatoes languishing in your fridge and you wanna get creative with them, you could do this. The actual recipe requires potato flakes, but if you've already got mashed potatoes, like use those babies up. I don't see how this could be bad. <laughs> potatoes, hot dogs, cheese. I mean, I like all those things. Hopefully it's cooled down enough. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I mean, this is, this is good. Of course it is. <laughs> I feel like uh, kids might like this a lot too. And they might even be able to help assemble this. Will I make it again? It is kind of a weird recipe, right? Like I kind of didn't think about putting these things together in this way. I've definitely made Frankfurter casserole that had potatoes in it. So that, I mean, the combination of ingredients really makes sense to me, but like I've never assembled it like this. I think if I had this stuff on hand and I wanted to like put something together for myself quickly, yeah, I think I would make this. Bake time wise, it, bake it for, I would say it doesn't actually need 20 minutes. I think I went maybe like 12 minutes. You know, you want your cheese to be melted. You want your hot dog to be heated through and you know, you want a little brownness on top. Super easy, <laughs> very interesting. And now I know what a hot dog s'more tastes like. My dinner this evening is going to start with these chicken breasts in foil. This is gonna be like a bone in chicken breast too. So we'll see how it turns out. You know, I wanted to give it a, a fair shake because it's not like a method of cooking I usually use for like meat. I've done like vegetables and stuff like that in foil packets. I guess I've even done like hamburger patties, but like for this type of thing, especially bone in skin on, I would typically season it, probably let it sit overnight in the fridge and then like roast it in the oven. Uh, also, <laughs> this video uh, has taken a bit of a turn because I'm not feeling great. And I realized I didn't have one of the ingredients, so I am gonna have to substitute something and it's, it's not gonna make some of you very happy, but I don't wanna hear it. <laughs> we'll get through this together. It's not that serious, folks. So basically I'm making kind of like a seasoned butter to put on the chicken before I wrap it. So it says blend butter with seasonings. So I've got some very soft butter here and those seasonings include, first off the, the ingredient I had to substitute, these are dried chives. I know people have a lot of feelings about dried chives and things, but I, I'm not feeling up to going to the store to run out and get chives. So it, they're gonna have to be dried today, guys. You know, and I'm aware like fresh would be probably better, but at this point it's not happening. <laughs> we also have just a bit of paprika and then some salt. Let me get my, I need some pepper as well. Got some fresh pepper. This particular recipe was meant to be cooked in a foil packet and you can roast it in the oven, which is what I'm doing, but you can also cook it on a grill in the foil packet. I don't know if it were me and I, I cooked this in a foil packet on the grill, I'm sure I would probably end up, you know, also grilling the chicken, like maybe towards the end just to get a little bit of a nicer color on it. But we'll see, maybe this will maybe this will surprise me. Place chicken breast on individual pieces of foil and then top with the butter mixture. So I'm gonna try to like spread this on a little bit, kind of get in there with my spatula. I feel like there was a real like foil packet cooking craze in the 90s. There were, I think it was like Reynolds Kitchens, you know, the people who make Reynolds wrap and the foil and stuff. I think they even maybe had like cookbooks and stuff. 
but it was like, yes, foil packets for everything. And I know like this cookbook was published in the sixties and they were using foil packets back then too. But I felt like at one point it was like, put everything in a foil packet and cook it up. So that is what my chicken breast looks like. I think this is the first time on this channel that I've cooked raw chicken. Can you believe that? Oh no, I think I did one recipe in the crock pot. Uh, for cream cheese chicken, that that starts with raw chicken. Yeah, I'm pretty comfortable like cooking poultry and stuff actually. So I don't know why it's taking me this long. So I'm supposed to do this tightly, bring in the ends here as well. Do I have enough space? Yeah, I do. It says bake at 350 for one hour. I'm gonna do that, but I'm also, I'm just gonna watch the temperature cause I'm not really sure this could take longer or not, you know, but I wanna make sure that I cook it enough. So my chicken, it just has a few minutes left in the oven. So I'm gonna move on to these savory green beans as a side dish. And it does use canned green beans. I know not everybody's favorite. I'm gonna be using these French style beans because I had them in my pantry. And you know, I've said it in this video, I'm trying to use some things up. Okay, and it does say, like normally I would drain some of the liquid off of these, but nope, says to heat them in the liquid. So that is what I'm doing. <laughs> Heated the beans drained the beans gonna add the beans back to this pan i got this little cool little strainer scoopy thing and it is a joseph joseph product from the makers of the twist whisk as you can tell i do love their products i have to add a tablespoon of butter to this and mix that in so butter is melted and now i have to put them into a like shallow dish this is such a weird a weird order of things if you ask me. That is way too big of a dish. I overdid it. I'm not turning back now. <laughs> Sprinkle with vinegar. I have a teaspoon of just some apple cider vinegar. So I'm sprinkling it. I also have two tablespoons of grated Parmesan cheese. I like getting this kind from Trader Joe's. So now I have to stir that together. And I also have to add croutons to this, but I don't wanna add those just yet because I'm not gonna eat all of this right away. And I think that I'm gonna put those croutons on as kind of like a topping as I plate this. I added a little just a little dish of fruit cocktail for dessert. This is actually left over from my recent 1960s salads video and I wanted to finish it off. So I thought it does kind of go perfectly with this meal, doesn't it? I am gonna start, well, first off, I know the chicken is looking a little pale. It was cooked in a foil packet, like it steamed inside rather than like roasting and getting the skin crispy. It is done. I did check the temperature. I have a little probe thermometer that I like to do that with. It has rested a few minutes while I finished up the green beans. But I'm gonna start by trying the green beans. So this was a pretty simple side dish, but a little different with that vinegar and the cheese. I was very curious about it. Hmm, that is really interesting. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I know I, my face probably looked really shocked. It was, you get that like vinegar punch right off. And it's not even a lot of vinegar. It's a teaspoon for the whole can of green beans. And then the cheese comes in. It's kind of cool. Let me try it with a crouton. It doesn't really need the croutons. I would say like mix the croutons, but I kind of like the vinegar and cheese with the beans. I've never had anything quite like that. I've made like sweet and sour green beans. I made seven up green beans like a long, long time ago that had vinegar and seven up and stuff. These are really good. I've never thought to put Parmesan cheese and vinegar with my green beans. They taste kind of pickled, like, I guess, because of the vinegar. It's just really interesting, and I do like it. Simple as it is, it's, it is a pretty good flavor. So I'm gonna try this chicken. It smells really good. My preference on cooking, like, bone and skin on chicken is gonna be to season it, let it sit for a few hours at least, and then roast it in the oven so the skin gets brown. But this has, like, a good scent to it. It seems like it's, yeah, it's nice and juicy. Yeah, I just kind of wanted to cut into it and see what it even looked like. Nice and juicy. Not gonna lie, a little plain for me. I don't think the seasonings, this is my personal opinion, I don't think the seasonings also like really had enough time to sort of like get in there. That's kind of why I'm a season ahead of time person, if you can. I'm gonna eat it. 
Like it tastes, it tastes fine. It's chicken. It's fine. I, I probably wouldn't make it this way again, just cause I really, I really already have like my own kind of like method that I like to use for roasting chicken. And then after like this super flavorful green bean side dish with all the, with the vinegar and the cheese, like this was a little bit underwhelming, but it's fine. Again, if you don't like super flavorful, <laughs> that sounds bad. If you don't like chicken with like a lot of extra seasoning, like this would be great, I think. It tastes fine, but it's just like, it's not my preferred method. Fru I know what fruit cocktail tastes like, <laughs> but I'm gonna, I'm gonna taste it anyway. I did add those extra cherries on top because I had some maraschino cherries in my refrigerator. So I thought, why not? Mm. I love a maraschino cherry. It really did kind of like boost the flavor on this one. Gonna enjoy my dinner. Gonna take maybe a day or two, and then I'll come back with some final thoughts. So for this round of 1960s meals, full day, I used the Pillsbury Family Cookbook. So this is one of those, this kind of book that like encompasses everything. My favorite book, like catch all kind of cookbook as I like to call them is The Joy of Cooking. It's right here. <laughs> and this is my 75th anniversary edition that I got in the early 2000s and I use it for a lot of things. And that's kind of like what this type of book was intended to be. This probably would have made a great gift for someone who was just learning how to cook, maybe a great gift for like a bridal shower, a newlywed, that kind of thing. You know, it's not like a specific cookbook that is just for cakes, just for pies. It's got all of that in here. So cakes, cookies, main dishes, meats. And I love the color. I love that it is blue. And then it's got this like yellow checkerboard on the back that I also really love. I feel like this cookbook is maybe not quite as popular as say, you know, Betty Crocker's picture cookbook or, you know, Better Homes and Gardens new cookbook. It's maybe not quite as iconic, but I think it's just as much fun. The Betty Crocker picture cookbook, it's it's got that very memorable like red and white cover. If you go like a Better Homes and Gardens, you know that you're gonna probably get something that's that's like a red and white gingham. So I love that this one is blue. It's It kind of stands out that way. On the back of this, it says, show and tell creative cooking and pictures, 1,764 family tested recipes, over 230 color illustrations, charts and diagrams, and 528 pages of easy to read text. I'm gonna hold this up because I couldn't really, I had to read it off of the back. My camera didn't wanna focus, but that's that little passage, that little section that I just read. And like a nice close up look of the back of the cookbook. Because it is a Pillsbury cookbook, it does feature some Pillsbury products. It's very similar to like Better Homes and Gardens or the Betty Crocker picture cookbook, because in the, in the beginning it has like a guide to better cooking. It has a glossary of terms, you know, anything that you maybe would want someone to know if they're not very familiar with cooking yet or not. You know, this can also be very helpful if you have more experience in cooking. Here's a section of like different tools and what they're called, what they're used for, cooking shortcuts, lots of very, very handy things to know, how to measure liquids, dry ingredients or shortening, etc. But we start, we start the book with appetizers some entertaining happening. <laughs> I just really love the sort of, let me get that overhead shot of different snacks and appetizers that you can serve at a party. Baked tuna balls, bacon wraparounds. Oh boy, <laughs> this doesn't hold a lot of magic for me. It's like celery stuffed with things, which I'm not into. And then this like, I mean, this is actually kind of cool. I just can't eat it, it's like stuffed shrimp. If you wanna serve these at a party, I'm probably going to have to politely decline. <laughs> beverages following the appetizers because you can't have a party without a few beverages. Breads, cakes, frostings and fillings, cookies, outdoor cookery, like so many things. That's why I love these types of cookbooks. Shows you the basics of a lot of different dishes, but then kinda gives you some little extras too so that you can mix things up, make things special. Ooh, look at these desserts. Love them. These cakes. Oh, look how pretty these cakes are. I love this, the pastry and pies. I just, something about the way that they photograph this, it's so great to me. And like, there are a few photos that are so, they like did them in such a creative way. So this one, like I originally saw, sorry, that photo, and I'm like, oh, this, the page is stained. The page is not stained. This is pie dough, like it's pie crust and it's being rolled out, but the way that it looks, they kind of put, you know, overlaid the black and white illustration over it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I get it now. That's so funny. How clever. Getting into the dishes that I made today. My breakfast consisted of quick nut bread, and I chose walnuts, and an egg 
baked in a bacon ring. Great breakfast. I'm really enjoying baked eggs. I like them a lot. They're so good and they're very easy. You know, I can cook an egg pretty quickly. I can make a scrambled egg um, or a fried egg, you know, a sunny side up egg. But if it's a situation where you have some more time or you want to get something else done, crack an egg into a dish, season it, put a little cream or whatever in there and pop it in your toaster oven. If you're trying to do those kinds of eggs for a crowd. Again, such an easy thing to do because you just kind of like crack eggs in dishes, you can put them on a sheet pan and bake them. It's not something that needs like your constant, constant attention. I enjoyed the walnut quick bread as well. I feel like I'm not doing a very, a very good job of describing the flavor. It's just like very lightly sweet. And sometimes I want that, you know, like I want sort of a cakey quick bread texture or like a muffin texture, but I don't want that like, in your face sweetness. I just want to, you know, I want a little snack. I think this one is a really good one. I would definitely make that one again. I might try to make it into muffins. I think it would freeze well. For my lunch, I had hot dog s'mores and carrot raisin salad. Carrot raisin salad, I, I know it's probably not a favorite of everyone. I enjoy it and it's pretty simple. There's not a lot of extras in it. Yes, there's raisins and peanuts, but it's not, you know, too many things. The dressing is just like a tiny bit of mayonnaise. I really enjoyed the peanuts in there. It gave a nice little extra like crunch texture and then the saltiness too. And it's something that you can make a small batch of and then leave it in your refrigerator. I actually had the rest of it today for lunch. Great little way to get your veggies and very simple to put together. Now those hot dog s'mores, what an interesting recipe. This is not something I have ever had before. It tasted good because of course it did. It's, it's like things I like, cheese, mashed potatoes, hot dogs. I, I've never thought of putting all of that together in that way. I've made like Frankfurter casseroles with potatoes in them, but like this is sort of a fun presentation, I think. So then for dinner, I had chicken breast baked in foil and then I had savory green beans. Okay, those savory green beans, like so interesting and very tasty and I, I know some of you don't really like canned green beans. I, I usually go frozen or fresh. I don't mind canned, but that's, I was using them because they, they were called for in this recipe, but you can easily do the same thing with frozen or fresh green beans for sure. The saltiness of that Parmesan cheese and then that like vinegar punch. It wasn't even a ton of vinegar. It was just a teaspoon for that entire can, but it was so good. Like it really added something different to it. I would say the, cr the croutons not absolutely necessary. The only way I would add the croutons if, is if this were a dish where you were gonna put it in like a casserole dish and then bake it in the oven, I would probably crumble those on top and it would make a nice crunchy topping. It's not absolutely necessary. Um, I think you can do it if you want, but I think the Parmesan and the vinegar like add enough to these beans and like dress them up enough that it kind of makes it something special on its own. The chicken breast baked in foil, I know. <laughs> I did not use fresh chives for this, but I don't think fresh chives would have saved this. And it's not, when I say saved this, I, I don't mean that it was bad. It was fine. It was chicken. It was juicy. It just didn't have as much flavor as I usually like. I've had these feelings lately where sometimes we think like every food has to be the best thing we've ever had. And it just kind of sets this unrealistic expectation for things. It has to be so flavorful or it has to have the best of the best of whatever. And I think that it kind of sets us up for disappointment in a way. I wasn't exactly disappointed in this chicken. I, I kind of knew how it was going to turn out, but I wanted to try it anyway. Of course, with a few, with a few changes, I think it would be even tastier, but then it would not be this recipe. It was absolutely fine. So that chicken breast was way too big for me to eat all of it myself. So what I ended up doing is I ate some of it and then I just kind of took the chicken off the bone and shredded it and it's perfectly fine to use in other things. I'm gonna use some of it in a salad. If I cook more chicken than I need, like I'll just shred it and I'll use it. And it's, it's great, you know, it's great to have cooked chicken on hand to put in other things. So I think that was like a good application of this chicken breast after I was kind of like done having some for dinner. <laughs> I feel like I'm kind of like babbling and rambling here, but there's just this like thought that every food has to be the best and like has to taste the best. And I get it, like life is short, you don't know what's gonna happen, but I don't think everything has to be like absolutely just mind-blowingly amazing every time. And you know, that was kind of this chicken. It was the type of thing where you would cook the chicken 
and then you would probably have a couple of side dishes with it and it would be a perfectly fine weeknight dinner. I probably wouldn't make it exactly that same way because I kind of have my own method that I like to use for making that kind of chicken, but I think it was a good experiment. I'm glad that I gave it a try. So that was my second version of a full day of 1960s meals. I hope you liked this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. If you love cookbooks and recipes from the 1960s, I have an entire playlist and I'll link it in the description down below. If you'd like to see some additional content from me, you can join me over on Patreon. I'll leave a link in the description if you're interested in joining. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.